Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our May lecture in our Understanding ADHD series. I'm Cheryl Gedelman from the Northern Virginia and DC chapter of CHAD. Our chapter, CHAD of Northern Virginia and Washington, DC, is one of the many chapters of CHAD National. We are a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in a number of ways. In addition to offering this free monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months, except in the summer, we also have support groups for parents, students, and adults, as well as an annual resource fair to highlight ADHD Awareness Month in October. While we're all volunteers, we cover other expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorship. We urge you to become a member of CHAD. I'm pleased to introduce Evan Weinberger, the CEO of Illuminous LLC, an award-winning and research-driven program that helps children build executive functioning skills needed to be successful in the classroom and beyond. With Summer in mind, Evan Weinberger will present Unlocking Summer Potential, The Secrets to a Fun and Productive Break. Welcome, Evan. Well, thank you, Cheryl and oh, Chad of Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. for having me. And welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So today we're going to talk about summer, right? This is the time of year that we look forward to. This is the time for us to uh, break from the craziness of the school year. And it's a, it's a balance. So before we get into it, I always appreciate when speakers tell me a little bit about their lens. Okay, so my name is Evan Weinberger, and I want to tell you about, about my lens. I grew up in Texas. I went to a small um, Jewish private school my whole life, um, pretty ready access to teachers, which was really good for me as I was diagnosed very early with ADHD, ADD, now ADHD, primarily inattentive type. Somehow I got a little bit more hyperactive uh, apparently in high school, um, but always did well in school. It took me three to five times longer to actually complete my work. And so there was quite a bit of chaos behind the scenes, but you wouldn't necessarily know it from my grades. And I was lucky. I had a, a alignment of stars where I had a father who was a clinical psychologist, so I was uniquely aware of some of the challenges that I had um, and how I learned differently. Um, I didn't suffer from some of the things that students with learning differences you know, kind of suffer through these thoughts of, am I stupid? I just, you know, is there something wrong with me? You know, et cetera. I knew I was capable and bright, but I just needed to learn a little bit differently. Um, however, as I matriculated through school, I learned more and more about how lucky I really was um, and how that experience was, was really unique and decided uh, in early graduate school as I was doing doctoral work in industrial and organizational psychology, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment, um, I, I decided why are we reserving this kind of executive coaching and help with executive function skills uh, strictly for high level executives at you know, Coca-Cola, Uber, American Airlines, et cetera, that as students make that critical transition uh, with and without learning differences from elementary school where you have one or two core teachers to that middle school setting where you have six, seven, eight different teachers that are giving you short, medium, long-term assignments on top of family obligations and extracurricular activities, et cetera, um, how oftentimes the hardest part of school uh, becomes the administrative component, right? Ju having the systems in place to juggle all those different kinds of demands um, on on you as an individual and and the work itself sometimes that adds stress too but I see a lot of really bright capable students get lost in not having the right systems in place to make that transition successfully you know and then in high school structure is similar but the expectations sort of pick up a lot and then as we matriculate into college I preach all the time around the country um, about how the biggest transition kids make in their entire lives is that transition from high school to college you know, of course, you add learning differences along the way, um, and that journey, that path, that trajectory is going to look a little bit different. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about, you know, what I do professionally here at the end. But today, without further ado, I want to talk about unlocking summer potential and the secrets to a fun and productive break. 
So here are the topics for today. We'll talk about the summer dilemma and how we have inherently some competing priorities here. We'll talk about finding the right balance of those two competing priorities. Uh, we'll talk about summer tips for parents. That's why you're here about setting goals and maintaining a daily routine, creating a schedule, choosing activities for the summer. And then there's some additional considerations about the screen time, medications, uh, revisiting your goals and the importance of that reflection. And there's some bonus material at the end too. So there's some highlights of what we'll be going over this evening. So the competing priorities. So summer is a time for much needed and well-deserved break. You know, resetting after a hardworking school year, um, again, six, seven, eight different classes. Uh, for some students, those final projects and exams uh, whether cumulative or not, can be really stressful, right? I'd love, I always tell students, I'd love to meet the person that had this idea that uh, at the end of the year, let's, let's, let's test kids on everything we taught them all year. And, and then someone else chimes in and says, let's do it across all of their classes, right? And let's do it all in the same week. So I, I know that doesn't apply in every school district or to every student at every level, um, but there's, there's still those sentiments, and in a lot of places, there are these cumulative exams, right, over everything that you learn the entire year crammed into this one or one week or week and a half long period. So resetting after a hardworking school year, socializing and developing outside the classroom, so important. And then, of course, it's a time for unique opportunities, traveling, experiences, things that kids will remember forever and are enriching in their own ways. However. The competing priority of summer is also these few months away from formal classes. There's a lot of things we don't have the opportunity to do, right? And so summer is also a great time for academic remediation and enrichment, right? So avoiding this widely known summer slide, this heavily researched idea that kids lose some of their academics that they've, that they've learned throughout the year, a lot of that goes to the wayside. Not, not all of it, but some of it goes to the wayside over those summer months. Uh, we saw that in a big way, uh, you know, during COVID, the months of summer, right? It started a couple months, the last couple months of the school year in 2020, and then we had the normal summer months, and then schools were faced with this impossible decision of what do we do, right? Kids are behind. We know that. Uh, we know about the summer slide, but this was like a summer super slide or a summer avalanche. So what now that we're getting back into the classroom, much long after we thought we would, um, this idea of the summer slide was just extended um, longer than any of us would have ever expected. So teachers were faced with this, this impossible decision, right? So our kids are behind. Do we plow forward and cover all the material that we are supposed to cover this year? Um, or, but then you got a class full of kids that are that are largely lost? Or do we spend more time than we usually do reviewing, right? A lot of the things that they may have missed and clarifying concepts and making sure they have those that foundation of the fundamentals. Um, but the problem there is the more time you spend doing that, you're just carrying forward the problem, right? So you're not gonna get to everything you need to get to the following year. Uh, so, so avoiding the widely known summer slide, addressing areas of concerns from teachers. So you may have, during your progress reports, you may have, or parent-teacher conferences, you may have seen patterns and things that teachers were saying about your child. You know, we, maybe two or three of the teachers said um, there were some commonalities there. We need to boost writing skills. You know, Joey needs to work on writing skills or, um, you know, these, these math concepts, you know, even if it's a science class, some of those formulas are still based in math, right? So, we applying math concepts, we really need help with that, reading comprehension, you know, et cetera. So addressing areas of concern where there may not be time during the, the hectic school year to do that. Um, reviewing and previewing to maximize readiness. This is, is certainly speaking in general, but specifically, more specifically, looking at those courses that are cumulative in nature, right? So if a student is going from pre-algebra to algebra one, in Algebra 1, they are assuming that you have mastered the fundamentals and the concepts, the core concepts from pre-algebra, and, and you really need to have mastered those in order to not get dinged again and to really absorb and thrive in Algebra 1 and so, so on and so forth. Geometry, Algebra 2, pre-calculus. You know, so math is a great example of, of something that's cumulative. And, and by the way, the impact of COVID, um, now the research is confirming what we we're suspecting, which is in those cumulative type of courses like math, 
we, we see some kids being the most behind in those areas. Um, so reviewing and previewing to maximize readiness. That's also, summer's a great time to do that. Filling in learning gaps, lingering from COVID. We talked about that, completing school assigned summer work. So schools will, depending on you know public, private, and what district you're in, where you are, um, schools will often put together packets, packets of math problems to work through or books that you need to read over the summer and be prepared uh, either bring in some kind of book report, uh, there's an assignment associated with it, or you need to be prepared to take a, a test or complete an assignment related to those books when you get back to school. So completing school assigned work. So what do we do about these competing this much needed and well-deserved break mixed with this wonderful time and opportunity for remediation and enrichment of all different kinds? So the answer is you do both, right? There is uh, if you do the math, 24 hours in a day times seven days a week, there are 168 hours a week. Normally, kids are spending about a third of that time in school um, and a third of that time sleeping. So obviously, in the summer, they're still sleeping. And we'll talk about that, too. But they're still sleeping over the summer. But there's all this additional time. So 168 hours per week, certainly kids could dedicate a couple hours a day to enrichment and remediation and readiness and not interfere with summer with summer fun. So there's plenty of time for, for all of those things um, if you start early in the summer. Um, this is especially important for students with, with ADHD or kids with ADHD, um, maintaining a schedule and maintaining rhythm and routine um, and other things that we're gonna talk about in some of our other slides here. It's especially important for students with ADHD uh, helps with ongoing development of executive function skills. So everything that we are going to talk about regarding summer um, and the slides and the rest of this presentation, all will help students develop critical, absolutely essential executive function skills. Those set of skills that lie at the foundation of kids' success, those planning skills, organizing skills, um, scheduling skills, juggling multiple tasks successfully, right? Um, the Some of the social skills and then development around that. So um, keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this presentation. So this is why you're here, right? Summer tips for parents. So my hope is that everybody today and everyone listening to a potentially recording later, my goal is that everybody walk away with at least two or three ideas. Then it's a win. Then I'm happy. Two or three ideas for summer that maybe you hadn't thought of before. Um, and so we're going to talk about setting goals for the summer. We're going to talk about daily routine. We're going to talk about creating a schedule um, different than a routine, right? Routine um, is more, you know, what do Mondays and Tuesdays look like? What do Wednesdays and Thursdays look like? What do weekends look like? So general kind of routine, creating a schedule that's more activities, right? So that time in between some of those regular things, waking up, bedtime, meal times, um, that's more kind of your schedule. And then choosing activities. What kinds of activities are we going to choose for the schedule? And then there's some other ideas and tips about managing screen time and asking, talking to your uh, either pediatrician or psychiatrist who might manage your child's ADHD medications. Um, talk to them about, about summer. Uh, there may be some adjustments that they recommend for summer or even taking students off medication over the summer. And then revisiting and assessing goals. That reflection time is really important and will help families, parents inform what their kids enjoyed and, and inform their plans for, for future summers. So we're going to talk about all of this. So goal setting. Let's, let's talk about goal setting. Um, so SMART goals. SMART goals, I still, you can Google this. I don't, we could do a whole lecture just on SMART goals. I still feel like SMART goals, even after 17 years of this kind of work, that using the SMART goals system is a wonderful way of creating goals. Um, just a quick overview. Uh, SMART is an acronym. S is for specific. The goals need to be specific, um, uh, measurable. So it's, you can't be, I'm going to meet more people, right? It needs to be measurable. I'm going to meet uh, I'm going to have three play dates a week um, for half the summer or between this date and this date. So it needs to be measurable. You need to be able to look back and easily and objectively say, I accomplished this goal or I didn't, right? Otherwise, you'll get into situations where the kids are like, well, I did do that. Parents are like, well, did you? I mean, you did that once or twice. Well, I did, you know, so it needs to be measurable. 
attainable. So that has to do with like being realistic. It needs to, it can't be too lofty, too crazy, too out, you know, out there in left field. It needs to be actually realistic and attainable. And then relevant. Um, it needs to actually pertain to uh, some objective, right? So whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether it's fitness related, boosting math skills, you know, et cetera, the goal should be relevant. So specific and relevant. Um, and then finally, time bound. So there needs to be um, a start, right? You're making these goals and it's by this time or by this date, I will be, I will do A, B, C, X, Y, and Z, right? So there needs to be time bound again. So that reflection um, is easy and objective. Um, involve your child, right? So um, I love this idea in, uh, you pull up any psychology textbook and it's in a lot of parenting kind of manuals, so to speak, but this idea of false choices. Um, so I, you want to involve your child. You want them to have some control over the activities that you choose or things that you do as a family over the summer. But this idea of false choices where you present your child with several choices, all those choices are acceptable to you. Um, and are realistic, possible, you know, uh, financially responsible, you know, et cetera. Um, but they have, they feel like they have the freedom of choice. So, and they do to an extent. So you can choose between these things that I'm offering you, but I'm going to give you the choices with which to choose from, right? Um, so that's the idea of false choices, but involve your child in the summer. They want that you want them to buy in, you want them to be excited. Um, and you do care about what they, some of their preferences, right? Um, and it should be a mix of both personal and academic, right? So it shouldn't be limited in scope to just goals related to academics and the summer activities related to academics. Um, make sure that there's a, a nice mix of personal growth too. And, and it's hard to separate those completely. Sometimes things are entirely fun and don't involve learning. Sometimes things involve learning, but kids don't find them fun. But there are also activities that are fun, but also enrichment and enriching and kids learn something. Um, so keep that in mind too. And you wanna find a healthy balance of that. Um, and then include mandatory summer school work. So like we, like we said, sometimes schools will give packets that kids have to work through over the summer. The intent is to do a little bit you know, each week uh, and achieve a certain amount kind of each month so that you're not cramming it in all two or three days before school starts. I know that that happens sometimes, um, but we want to try and avoid that. So include mandatory summer schoolwork and time allocated to that inside of schedules, routines, you know, et cetera. Now, maintaining a routine. So I, I talked about the differences between kind of routines and schedules. Um, but what do I mean by routine? So this is more of a kind of a daily and, and weekly routine. Um, the, it's going to look different than it does in the school year. And that is, that is expected and that is 100% okay. However, that being said, even if the time to wake up is different over the summer, there still should be a wake up time. There should be a routine where kids uh, maintain that routine. They wake up around the same time. They have their meals around the same time. Um, and then there's, you know, times for activities and those activities will be different based on what you choose. And we'll talk about some parameters for that. Um, reflection time, that's really important. And not just reflecting on a daily basis or weekly basis, but reflecting say on a weekly basis and then at the end of the summer as well. So that reflection time of you know, was this as fun as we were hoping it would be? Was that really great family time? Did you have fun with your friend? Um, and was it nice bringing a friend on this on this trip or this outing with us? So that reflection time is is really important. Um, wind down time. So some kids are introverts, extroverts. It has to do with where you find your energy, right? So I have a busy day at work. Um, to me, going and you know hanging out with a few old friends. I get my energy back from doing that. Some people really do that by being alone, right? So that's what truly what introversion and, and extroversion really refer to. Um, but generally speaking, that wind down time is, is important. And you may have several children and one may be an introvert, one may be an extrovert. So it's, it's good and it's a safe bet to incorporate some, some downtime. Don't over schedule your summer. And then bedtime, um, based on when that wake up time is going to be, um, you know, have a bedtime. It's, you know, if they're going to sleep later, um, then it's, they probably need to wake up later. Kids still need that, you know, eight to nine hours of sleep on a, on a nightly basis. There's a little bit of difference there as the kids get older, but roughly eight to nine hours 
is what they should be getting for sleep. Um, so if they're staying up later, they they should be um, sleeping a little bit later too to still get those those eight or nine hours. Um, and then just a, a little tidbit or note, um, kids getting up on their own is one of the biggest predictors of success after high school. So this is a great time to, to practice that, getting kids used to hearing their alarm and then taking action. Are you a kid that needs to set two alarms? Your first one uh, you know, is kind of when you roll over and turn it off. The second one is when you get up, but try to get your kids over the summers. It's a great time to make strides with with getting them used to hearing their alarm and getting up on their own. And it is one of the biggest predictors of success post high school. Now use your goals, your SMART goals as a guide as you create a schedule. So we're talking about schedules now for the summer, different than your daily routine. This is your schedule. What kind of activities are you gonna choose? Um, so use your goals as a guide as you choose activities. Make sure that there's uh, some that are productive or around learning, that there are some that are enriching about new experiences, whether that's seeing new places, eating at new restaurants, trying new foods, you know, whatever it might be. And then there's structured, semi-structured, and unstructured activities, and it should include an array of all of those. That's important. Um, and then share a physical or digital family calendar um, so that everybody kind of knows uh, what's what's going on from day to day and from week to week. Everybody, it's important that everybody is on the same page. A few other tips about creating a schedule. Uh, it's it's helpful to have a start date. So when you meet together as a family, and it might take several sittings to do this, maybe it's over your meals leading into summer, set up a start date for this new routine from the previous slide, and then for this schedule of activities throughout the summer. Uh, and that way kids you know, kind of know what to expect, what's coming up, when this new thing is going to start. You'll get a little bit less kind of pushback and, and resistance. Um, and by the way, this is the same for the back to school schedule. So since the summer schedule is going to you know, look different than your school schedule, make sure that you take into account that it's important um, a, a week, maybe even two before school starts, um, to start that school schedule, make that adjustment to bedtimes and wake up times, you know, et cetera, to start getting kids readjusted back to back to the school year. Um, also include chores and responsibilities. I, I'm a big fan that kids, uh, you know, I don't care how many, what, what you have in the way of resources, that kids should be contributing to a functioning household, um, whether it's taking dishes to the sink, uh, whether it's things related to lawn care, landscaping, you know, pool, uh, whatever it might be, um, kids need to have responsibility, especially students with ADHD need to feel like they have a job to do and that they're accomplishing something, um, whether they they can express that to you or not, that's important for them. Um, and so make sure that you're building in regular chores and, and responsibilities. Also build in a lot of buffer room. Be careful about kind of when you're scheduling things too close to each other. Uh, make sure you've got that, that wind down time. And then incorporate family values. Um, some folks will go to temple, synagogue, church uh, on a weekly basis, monthly basis. Uh, make sure that your summer schedule appreciates those family values and incorporates those kinds of things into the schedule of family activities as well. Ah, so choosing activities. So align activities with your child's interest. Uh, and you may have several children and they may be at different ages. Um, so different kinds of activities will be age appropriate to them. And they also may have different interests. They likely will. Um, so align activities, include them in the process and align those activities with things that are interesting to them. Um, only offer possibilities that are acceptable to you. That goes back to that false choice you know, idea. So as you make a list of possible activities and everybody should have this, um, parents should throw things on that list that seem fun to them and kids should throw things on that list. And the idea is there is a master list and we work as many of those things that are feasible, workable, schedule-wise into the summer. Um, emphasize outdoors and um, kind of hands-on activities, especially for students with ADHD. And there's a genetic component to that. So oftentimes we can, we can tie their ADHD to at least one parent, right? So there's likely going to be multiple people in the house with some degree of ADHD. Um, and so emphasize outdoor activities. There's um, 
there's a, a lot of research behind that. Um, but at the same time, kids are risk takers. ADHD students are risk takers. Kids are risk takers. And so stay close to your kids. Make sure that they, um, that they are, are engaging in activities uh, that are safe and they engage activities in a safe way. Um, so stay close, you know, don't hover too much, but, but be close. Um, and structured programs. So there are camps. Camps can be one day, they can be one week, um, it can be sleepaway camp. Um, and so talk about what your children might enjoy. Um, consider that you may have to have several meetings because you might look into options. Uh, there's different price tags associated with those options. And then ultimately add whatever to the list feels feasible for your family. Sports activities, remaining active, exercise, you know, et cetera. Those are also really great activities, programs, et cetera, for the summertime. Um, and then academic coaching and tutoring. So, you know, unless you're in education, oftentimes, uh, you know, school looks a lot different than it did, you know, even 10 years ago, certainly 15, 20, 25 years ago. And so uh, bringing in some academic coaches and tutors who have access to some assessments in order to um, assess uh, learning gaps and to maximize, you know, readiness and um, do some of that very strategic targeted uh, reviewing and previewing of material, um, you know, even if you just have a few sessions just to get that information, and then you can take over from there, you know, consider some academic and coaching and tutoring type of work um, over over the summer. Uh, managing screen time, I want to talk a little bit about screen time. This is a uh, a whole could be a whole topic, you know, in and of itself. Um, but setting limits for screen time, every household should have a a digital diet. I like to call it of of some sort. Um, the world of games and screens are just are are just different now. Um, it used to be when I was a kid, uh, you know, you get a game, you it's all you do for two, three, four days in a row. You beat the game and you kind of lose interest and. For the next special occasion, asked you know, asked my parents to buy me another game and kind of rinse and repeat. Now the whole world of games and screens are just totally, totally different. Um, games don't end anymore. You play online. There's somebody awake somewhere in the world. I don't know what language they speak necessarily, but somebody somewhere in the world is awake playing these games. Um, and there's you don't win. There's no way to actually win. You just conquer more territory, or you get more coins, or you get more, you know, uh, whatever money for this game. Um, and so the, the the whole world of of gaming, and we the game makers design them to be to be very addictive. And it's it's a tough predicament because kids often now need to be on screens. There's a growing amount of, of digital work that never sees paper and kids need their devices and need to be on screens to actually complete their work, right? So you, you can't just kind of take their computer away anymore. And there's tons of, of games on the computer and they have more tricks up their sleeve than we as parents know what to do with as far as skirting around any limits that we put in place. So, but do your best to create a a digital diet at home. And this is going to look different based on how old your children are how many kids you have in the house. Um, this is going to look different um, based on how much responsibility your child has shown with regard to setting their own limits on screen time in the past. Uh, maybe some prior experiences where they may have um, broken your trust, where you set some limits and they didn't abide by them. So the same formula doesn't work for every family as far as a digital diet. Um, your counselor at school can kind of start this conversation with you. Um, and certainly uh, there are, are are there many many therapists that can that can help uh, that you know that help families navigate this new world of screens and games and um, you know you can draw upon their rich knowledge and experience. Um, they've read some of the most current research books about that. So this is a, a potentially a topic for a whole other presentation. But the point is, everybody needs to have some kind of digital diet at home, and that is true for the summer. Even if you loosen the reins a little bit for summer, um, this is also true for the summer. And then that leads into monitoring content. So students, uh, especially ADHD students with some impulsivity, um, are it's important as parents that you have some way of monitoring the content that they are absorbing. Um, I know that it's really hard, um, but there are lots of programs and apps out there. Kids have found their way around some of those things. Um, sometimes the best solution is is to stay close, right? Check in on them frequently 
and kind of take a look at their screen and what they're doing, maybe watch something with them for a few minutes, talk about it. And if you hear or see something that you know, just kind of smells like it might be inappropriate, right? Um, then make sure that you are proactive and, and responsive to that. So make sure that you monitor their, their content on screens. And, and by the way, just another tidbit, um, I mentioned the whole world of, of screens and gaming has changed. Um, so has TV and commercials and the streaming on demand. Um, we are all about immediate gratification now. And so moving into 2023 here, um, the research tells us this was a study from late 2018. Uh, the latest research tells us that we can focus 100% of our attention. This is sad, but 100% of our attention uh, for one minute for every year of age. And this is true for kids all the way up to adults. One minute for every year of age, we can focus 100% of our attention on a task at hand. Um, and so I tell, you know, I tell, I tell students, uh, you know, I try to encourage them to use a, a visual timer. It helps with the concept of time management, but it's not just for completing schoolwork. I set one for three minutes when my kids brush their teeth, um, just so that they, they start to build that, that idea of, of the elapse, you know, how time elapses and what three minutes actually is, right? So um, if they're waiting to speak and two adults are speaking, three minutes might seem like eternity. And so kids, especially students with ADHD, kids with ADHD don't necessarily have the best concept of time. Um, things like a visual timer can help them, but just know as parents, uh, that that nowadays, I'll say, uh, nowadays that that we can only focus because it affects all of us, even adults too. A hundred percent of our attention for one minute for every year of age. So even kids in high school are setting these timers for fifteen to twenty minutes um, and focusing a hundred percent of their attention. Oftentimes, I get a question, but you know what? I can sit for two hours and do work, and so can my kid. Well, I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying that research tells us that your productivity and efficiency goes down. So um, it's at to, uh, to uh, operate optimally at optimum efficiency um, that taking that, that break, one minute for every year of age, and then taking what we call a short brain break. That doesn't mean uh, watching YouTube videos for two and a half hours. Um, it's more, it could be 10 jumping jacks and sitting back down. It's just, it's resting the neural pathways that you are using to, to do whatever task you were doing, whether it's talking to your grandmother, doing math homework, writing something, reading something, resting those neural pathways that you were using for the last you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, if you're really in a bind, you can actually switch activities, which will utilize a different set of neural pathways in your brain. And even that constitutes a brain break from the neural pathways you were using on the previous task. Um, prioritize, needless to say, prioritize off-screen activities. So much throughout the year is on screen. Like we said, they need their computers in order to complete homework assignments. Many kids are taking notes on, a, on an iPad or a computer at school. Um, prioritize during the summer off-screen activities. Um, you know, it could be with siblings, it could be with friends, uh, it could be as a family, just with family, you know, whipping out an old deck of cards, right? Just something, board games. Think prioritize off-screen activities. Kids get enough screen time throughout the throughout the school year, and then encourage you know learning apps and videos if they are going to have screen time. Um, you know, try to to get them to where it's a mix of things that are just exclusively fun, but also things that are fun using screens, but involve some element of learning. So you know, I have a, a few of these installed on my on my son's iPad and my daughter's too. Um, where if they really want to use their iPad, great, but I'm going to tell them you can, false choices, right? You can you can use this app or you can use this app. And either one of them incorporates some kind of learning inside of those apps and, and videos. So ask about medication. So I, I want to preface this with I'm not trying to give advice about your medication or, or, or suggesting changes to your medication. Um, uh, I didn't read those books. That's not my specialty. Um, however, um, summers do look and feel different, and that's okay. Summers look and feel different. So because summers look and feel different, um, 
it's it may or may not depending ask your doctor talk to your doctor there's different classes of medications some of them you know you can take it and then you cannot take it the next day and then you can take it the next day and that's just fine some other class of medications depending on what you're on and exactly for what um there is a a a a, a slow onboarding and then a weaning off process. So you can actually get sick if you take your medication and then just kind of stop taking it the next day. Um, so talk to your physician, talk to your psychiatrist, um, share your summer plans with them and your summer schedule, the kinds of things that you're going to be doing. You know, some students may be taking some classes for credit over the summer. So maybe that portion of the summer, the doctor may recommend continuing medication. But um, if you're going to be at a sleepaway summer camp and then after that, a family vacation, maybe not. Um, some doctors, uh, depending on the circumstances, want you to continue your medication regimen. So talk to your doctors, your physician, psychiatrist, whoever's managing those medications um, and ask them, share your schedule, share your calendar, or at least the content of it, and ask them for some advice. Should I be doing this the same way over the summer? Um, and even if you are going to take medication over the summer, they may suggest, um, you know, based on changes of, of wake up times and bedtimes, you know, and meal times, etc., they may suggest taking them at different times. So make sure that you start a conversation about that. If you will be traveling or if your child will be going off to camp and it's like a several weeks long sleepaway camp, another thing to consider is access to medication. So um, some of you may get, you know, a three month supply, but some of you may not. Um, and you may, you know, be getting a, a refill every so often and you don't want to find yourself in a place where uh, you need this medication. The doctor has suggested you continue to take it. Um, you're on vacation. Halfway through your vacation, you run out of medication. And since these medications are in different classes and some of them are more highly controlled, it can be a little bit messy and hairy to fill medications when you are away, certainly if you're abroad, you know, et cetera. So anticipate some of those kinds of things beforehand and have those conversations with your physician or psychiatrist. Um, and then for summer, you know, revisit and reflect, revisit your goals, reflect on the summer. Um, this is important for informing, you know, future, future summer plans, decisions. What did the kids like? What did they not like? What friends did they play well with? And they didn't, you know, as parents, you know, we know that certain when certain friends come over, it's double the work. But when other friends come over who are respectful of rules and have good manners, you know, et cetera, it actually takes a burden off of us, right? So we might have more kids in the house, um, but if they play really well together, um, it might actually be, be helpful and easier on us. So, you know, make those kinds of notes and have those kinds of discussions as parents, but then as a family, reflect on the summer. What did we do? What did we like the most? Did we, uh, was that trip too long? Was it too short? Did we like that camp? Do you want to go for longer next summer? Um, you know, do you want to try different sports or continue the same sports? Um, so that reflection over the summer is is really important. Um, and then revisit those goals, right? So if you use that SMART goal system and you created some summer goals, uh, maybe as a family and then specifically for each individual, um, go back and revisit those goals. Did we meet the goals? Did we meet some of the goals? Did we meet all of the goals? Did we exceed our goals? Um, and so have incorporate your goals into that discussion. Also, was was it fun? Um, and so that's important too. Uh, you know, was it fun? But equally important, was it relaxing? Also, was it enriching? Right. So if there were some academic goals, scholastic goals, um, did we achieve those? Um, and summer, you know, those competing priorities. We talked about finding a balance, and that the answer is is really doing both: finding a balance of of kind of fun and productivity. Um, so, how did we do in in that goal? Um, and uh, um, and then some, you know, some positive words for you. So, uh, praise your children. Be your child's biggest cheerleader. You know, remember when your kids were really, really young. And they had that, they, they're not walking yet. And they had that really big headed idea, right? So they're they're holding on to the coffee table and they're eyeing the edge of that, that couch over there. And today's the day, um, mom, dad, I'm gonna do it. They give you that big kind of googly eyed look. Um, then they they look at the edge of the couch, they look at you again, and they take those those first steps toward the edge of the couch, right? Inevitably what happens? They, they let go of the coffee table, they take a step, they take a second step, and then they fall over, right? That's what happens. Um, but most importantly, remember how you responded to that. When that happened, 
you responded with with relentless positivity, right? You probably went through, I'm gonna, I don't wanna age anybody, but you probably went through your Rolodex, right? Um, called everybody that you knew, you took pictures, grabbed your camera, oh my gosh, you took your pom-poms out from cheerleading many years ago that are deep in the closet. You pulled those out and got really excited. Um, yes, yes, Joey, you can do it. Come on, you know, get up, do it again, do it again, do it again. Kids still need us to play that same role in their life, right? We, we didn't say, you know, ah, Joey, you know, you idiot, you would have just waited, you know, three more weeks developmentally, you would have had the strength to make it all the way to the end of the couch. Of course not. It was relentlessly positive. It was 100% positive. Um, kids still need us to be their biggest cheerleaders. And as they get older and they have mouths on them, it becomes more and more difficult as parents to be that cheerleader for our children, that relentless cheerleader with endless positivity, um, but try your best. Um, I, you know, there's um, uh, parents who you know, are a little bit upset with themselves that they can get really frustrated at times. And there is a time for negative reinforcement and, you know, et cetera. Um, but I tell it, don't beat up on yourself. Um, just make sure that you get that much more excited and 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 shower them with positivity when good things happen, right? So they need that balance and it needs to be disproportionate on the positive side. It's so incredibly important. There's an entire new branch of psychology called positive psychology, right? Um, and uh, there was a big documentary about the power of, of positivity too and how we invite that into our lives. So remember, kids still need that 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 um, unconditional love and that unconditional positivity from us, um, and of course, as they get older, our job as parents um, is to is to show them a way and to create uh, boundaries, you know, et cetera. So there is a time for negative reinforcement, um, but make sure that there's a balance and that it is it is tipping over um, heavily into the positive side, um, and then acknowledge effort above all. Um, so many of you may have heard the term growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, so in terms of we want, what we want is when kids are really young, they have an entirely growth mindset, right? They think they can do anything. Um, that's why you need to be their secret service, right? Don't bump your head here. Oh, don't walk here. Up, up, don't go up those stairs, right? Um, and so they they need us to be that almost like secret service for them because they think they can do anything. They think they can fly, right? Um, but that's also something that we love about kids. They're an entire, they have an entirely growth mindset. They are willing to try anything. And if they fail, they get right back up and they try again. As kids get older, that growth mindset starts to be replaced by a fixed mindset. And that's that part that that's what you see in kids when they they see a challenge and they're like, ah, oh, mom, I don't want to do that. That's too challenging. That's too hard. I don't even want to try because I'm going to fail, right? That fear of failure. And so we want to do what we can to encourage that growth mindset. And one of the ways that research tells us we can do that is by the power is in the process, acknowledging the process, acknowledging the effort, right? So instead of telling your kids, um, you know, hey, I, I, you performed really well on that. I'm, I'm proud of you. Or you guys won. I, I'm, that's unbelievable. I'm so happy. Instead, it's the focus should be more on, um, you know, I, it looks like I can tell you put a lot of effort into that. And I'm very proud of you for trying hard. And, uh, you know, I think this will ring with, with all the parents out there. Um, when our kids bring home a bad grade, we're disappointed. Um, and sometimes we have a tendency to be disappointed in the grade, right? But what we are really disappointed in is not their grade. It's that the grade does not reflect their best effort, right? And so we're really upset that they didn't put forth their best effort. But what comes out is, wow, that's an awful grade. You know, that's, that's terrible. Um, and so we want to keep it about, about effort. And that's how we, one of the big ways that we help kids maintain that that growth mindset. So so praise your kids and do so throughout the summer also. It's not all just about academics. It's about playing nice with friends. It's about making good decisions. Um, it's about when you give them a list of things to do and they complete them. Um, it's also about, about that and praising that, oh, I see you listened and you got everything done on the list. I'm so proud of you. That's, you know, that's really, really great. I can tell you put a lot of effort into remembering that. I really appreciate that. I know that's not the most fun thing to do, right? Or you remembered your chores every day last week. So the power is in the process and recognize the effort above all else. And then for you, for all the parents out there, you know, listen, parenting is hard. 
uh, and there is no universal solution for every family. All these things that we're talking about, um, as you work through some of these things, where you land is going to be different than where other parents, even on this particular presentation, are going to land somewhere different. And, and that's okay. There is no universal solution about, about any of the things we're talking about. The same schedule won't work for every family. The same activities won't work for every family. Um, the same routine and, and bedtime, wake-up times are not going to work for every family. Um, and the same rules around screen time and parameters around that are not going to work for every family. And so parenting is hard, and there's no universal solution that works for everyone. So when the days feel long and you feel overwhelmed, give yourself some some grace and just pat yourself on the back. You're you're doing a great job, right? You're doing a great job. And if your student is struggling, you know, listen, there's nothing that we know from research that you did to cause your child ADHD or emotional outbursts um, related to poor emotional regulation, you know, et cetera. It's not because you didn't breastfeed long enough. It's not because you didn't blend their food in a blender and put and make sure it was all organic and pour it into ice trays and then defrost them one at a time and make sure that that's all that your kid ate. There's nothing that we can tie issues with executive function, you know, et cetera. We know there's a genetic component, but there's nothing that that we can tie that you did. So so don't beat up on yourself. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, you're doing as much as you can right and, and hang in there and do your best. Um, and then enlist, enlist help. You know, the, the world is different and looks different than it did, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, we talked about some of the screen time challenges different. The whole educational paradigm is different. This idea of, of school portals, you know, et cetera, Th those things didn't exist. So the the challenges during the school year and over the summer are just are are different. More things beep, more things ding, more things have screens. Our attention spans, um, you know, look different. Kids do different things for fun. It feels like they're maturing faster. Um, they are, you know, they may be watching movies or seeing videos, or their kids are talking about things way earlier than we did, you know, as a as children ourselves. And as parents, all we know is what we did growing up over the summertime during the school year, the routines that we had. Um, that's all that we know. And that's what, what we're drawing from those experiences in order to help our children. And the world has changed so much. The world of school, the world in general, the world of travel, like all these things have changed so much that don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's academic support services, whether it is mental health professionals, therapists, counselors, um, it is not an admission of weakness or guilt of any kind. It's just saying, wow, this is so different than it was for me as a kid. Um, I want to talk to somebody who does this all day long and helps families uh, with you know, screen time, uh, digital diets, right? Um, and I want to know what best practices are now. And so it is not an admission of guilt. It's not that you're doing anything wrong. Um, so lean on other people. Also lean on friends and family, right? So maintain a list of, of, of folks in your trusted inner circle and learn from their experiences, the mistakes that they made, as well as the wins that they've had, um, things that worked for them. Um, some of it may or may not work for you, but you can try some of those things. So maintain a trusted inner circle. Talk to them about what are you doing this summer? What are your plans this summer? Um, what is the schedule or routine that you've set? Um, have you set goals? Um, what are you doing with regard to uh, you know, kind of having fun, but breaking that up here and there with some academics, right? What What do you have in place? Who are you using? What are you doing? What apps are you encouraging your kids to watch? Um, so learn from their experiences too, even though your childhood might have been different and your friend or family member's childhood may have been different and similar to yours, um, um, your friends and family may be experiencing some of the same challenges in this new educational paradigm in this new world we're living in and they have maybe have found some solutions that worked really nicely and give you some great ideas so the ideas can come from any direction and from anywhere so um, maintain that trusted inner circle um, and check in with them and get ideas from them um, and then summer camps and and backup activities so depending on where you live uh, you know the uh, the, your activities over the summer, uh, whether it's your trips or camp or plans that you had for a certain day, 
uh, sports, you know, in particular, may be disrupted because of weather, you know, et cetera. So keep a list of activities for, I call them rainy day activities, you know, figuratively or literally, um, but have some backup activities of some th something falls through, uh, something doesn't work out. Um, here is kind of a go-to list of things that we can do that are indoors or, you know, something like that. So, so I encourage everybody to keep a list of kind of rainy day activities. And, um, you know, outsource some of those day-to-day -day activities. So those day camps, you know, those week-long basketball camps or those week-long clinics, um, uh, they, you know, of course they come with a fee, but they have a, they have thought out of a clear schedule of things that are enriching, some things that involve learning. There are also like robotics type of camps, um, uh, you know, Minecraft kind of camps, you know, et cetera. So look into those camps and a lot of them you can enroll day by day or week by week. Um, so when you think of camp, a lot of us think of these sleepaway camps for weeks at a time. Um, I never personally like doing those myself. Um, I have chosen to give my kids the choice of whether they want to uh, entertain doing those kinds of things or not. Um, but it's camp is not just sleepaway camp. There are lots of other kind of camps, boot camps, workshops that are by the day or or by the week. So keep that in mind and and check those out. Um, and then resources. Uh, so there are lots of resources out there. Um, I'm just going to name a few, but, you know, there are a ton online, on YouTube, you know, et cetera. Um, but Attitude Magazine is fantastic. Chad's website has lots of information, um, great ideas. Um, the Center for the Developing Child, which is actually out of Harvard University, um, and uh, my fit, one of my favorite definitions of executive function actually come from them. Um, they have some really wonderful um, kind of articles and, and ideas um, for, you know, not just for summer, but certainly for summer um, for students or kids with ADHD, families um, with several people with ADHD. Um, so look out for resources and ideas, and you can make those part of your discussion uh, as a family. Um, and then finally, I promised at the end, I would I would kind of tell everybody uh, you know, what I do. So I operate a, um, a large academic coaching and tutoring organization while we do offer uh, traditional tutoring, you know, subject help in all subjects, K through 12 and early college, standardized test prep, college applications. Um, our bread and butter is a proprietary, all based in science, research driven, and now award winning curriculum for executive function, where we help students with all things organization, time management, study skills, advocating for themselves, etc. Um, we offer services in home, uh, in and around our, our biggest offices in Texas and, and the DC metro area here, um, as well as uh, virtually online to folks all over the country, and even uh, about a, a dozen folks outside of the country as of now. Um, and we are very active working with with students over the summer. Um, and so I, I know I shared a little bit about my lens and my upbringing and some of my experience with my own ADD and ADHD. Um, but uh, that's that's what I that's what I do. And I believe we now move into some uh, questions and answers. But before we do that, um, you know, the two nicest things that you know you can give anyone are time and attention. And every today gave me both. Um, and so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. This is fun for me. I enjoy uh, I enjoy presenting for webinars and certainly in-person presentations too. So thank you all for being here. And just the fact that you're here means you've taken a big step in the right direction or thinking ahead about planning a fun and productive summer. Um, keep in touch. Our contact information is here and we have free, free kind of tips year round, uh, whether it's a newsletter through our website um, our Instagram account. Uh, we're active on LinkedIn and Facebook as well. Um, and so find us, keep in touch, and keep in touch with those timely tips year round. Um, and if it's all right, I'd love to move into uh, some Q&A and answer some of your burning questions here. So, so Evan, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's awesome. Um, we have one question right now. Uh, does the 20-minute focused productivity apply to those over 18, does the research show that a 30-year-old can focus for 30 minutes and a 40-year-old for 40 minutes, or does it level out at that 20-minute boundary? Yeah, so this is, the research tells us that this is true for, um, uh, for young children all the way up through adulthood. 
Um, now the, the caveat or the asterisk would be, you know, as we get a lot older and there might be some other factors at play that may impact our memory ability to focus, you know, et cetera, you know, I would exclude that pool from this. Uh, but the research tells us that this same, these same rules apply to a 10 year old as well as they do to a 50 year old. Um, that one minute for every year of age. And again, it doesn't mean that you can't um, focus to some degree. It just means that you are not optimally um, efficient and optimally productive. Um, so we can focus on our attention. And it's also, it's not magic. So we still need to choose what has our focus. And so it could be a conversation that we're having on the phone. It could be an email that we're writing. It could be some math work that we're doing. It could be a schedule that we're creating, some goals that we're setting, um, or it could be you know, less productive choices. So um, like a, a student may choose to focus 100% of their attention on a video game that they're playing, right? So, uh, or, or somebody's cleaning their closet. I, I say the same thing for, you know, for medications, you know, there's not a magic pill. Um, so for anybody taking, you know, stimulants for attention related learning differences, um, it does help complete those synapses where more of those neurotransmitters are getting from one neuron to the next neuron. It does help to close that gap, but it's not magic. It doesn't mean that your kid is going to focus on their homeworks. I, some people will take a, a, a pill. It helps them with focus, but they are choosing to focus on a video game or cleaning their closet or everything but what needs their attention. So we still are important participants in our success, attention, choosing the right thing um, to have our focus at that time. But but to answer the question, the study um, the study does indicate that that this is true for ten year olds and fifty year olds. That same one minute for every year of age. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I don't see any other questions other than uh, I do know someone asked uh, and we do uh, email the recording link to everyone who registered and attended. And uh, Evan, is it possible for us to get a copy of your slides to send to the attendees? It would be my pleasure. I will send that to you as soon as we finish the presentation. And if anybody's interested in that, um, you know, please reach out. Happy, uh, happy to provide that, and and feel free. You have my permission to, to um, uh, supply that to anybody who's interested. Thank you so very much. This has been a very uh, wonderful presentation, very timely, um, and I hope everyone enjoyed it tonight. And we hope that we'll see you at um, an upcoming lecture. I believe we are taking hiatus. So I could be wrong. Uh, we may not have a June one, but uh, we'll definitely, if you're on our mailing list, you'll definitely get information for the, the next lecture that comes up. But Evan, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank you. And everybody, have a great summer. <laughs> Thanks.